This suggests, as Alan Watts used the example of a rainbow, that the world is created by the perceiver. So that was a rather long quote from Alan Watts, but it was very important in my understanding. Can you do his English accent? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Can you? No, but I love his English accent. <laughs> Alan Watts said, a rainbow exists only when there's a certain triangular relationship between three components, the sun, the moisture, and an observer. If all three are present, and if the angular relationship between them is correct, then and only then will there be the phenomenon rainbow. Now, diaphanous as it may be, a rainbow is no subjective hallucination. It can be verified by any number of observers, but because they're in physically in a different position, the rainbow will actually move slightly for each observer. The point is then that an observer in the proper position, some moisture and observer, is as necessary to the manifest manifestation of a rainbow as the other two components, the sun and the moisture. Of course, one could say that if the sun and a body of the moisture were in the right relationship, an observer, let's say on a boat or over the ocean, who sailed into the right position would see a rainbow. So the rainbow is really there. But one could also say that if the sun and an observer were in the proper position, and a cloud of moisture moved in, then there'd be a rainbow. Somehow the first set of conditions, the sun and the moisture in, in position without an observer, seemed to preserve the reality of the rainbow apart from the observer. But the second set, the sun and the observer with no moisture in the air, by eliminating a good, solid, external reality of cloud of moisture, seems to make it an indisputable fact that under such conditions there is no rainbow. Well, the reason is that it supports our mythology to assert that things exist on their own, whether there is an observer or not. It supports the fantasy that man is not really involved in the world, that he makes no real difference to it, and that he can observe reality without influencing or creating it. Watts went on to say, perhaps we can accept this reasoning without too much struggle when it comes to things like rainbows, whose reality status was never too high to begin with. But what if it dawns on us that our perception of rocks, mountains, and stars is a situation of just the same kind? You're simply saying only that creatures with brains are an integral feature of the pattern, which also includes the solid earth and the stars, and that without this integral feature, the whole cosmos would be as unmanifested as rainbows without droplets in the sky or without an observer. This notion makes us feel insecure because it unsettles a familiar image of the world in which rocks, above all, are symbols of hard, unshakable reality, and the eternal rock is a metaphor for God himself. This mythology had reduced man to an unimportant, an utterly unimportant little germ in an unimaginably vast and enduring universe. It is just too much of a shock too fast to switch, to recognize that this little germ, with its fabulous brain, is evoking the whole thing, including the nebulae, millions of light years away. Uh, force us to the absurd conclusion that before there were life forms there was nothing. Said there's something that's un 
you can't know what it is. The point is we know there's something that brings into being our experiential worlds and that we describe using metaphors, describe from those, de de derive from those experiential worlds. Metaphors such as it consists of underlying fabric consisting of protons, electrons, electromagnetic, and nuclear forces, all metaphors to try to get at what's underlying the world of our experience. We can describe this fabric using those metaphors and mathematical formula. But as can be seen in our fa total failure to answer my teacher's question about what an electron is, and in the examples of the red rose, where is the red, and the rose are in our brains, and rainbows, and the paradoxical quantum theory, the underlying fabric of the universe is fundamentally, and in its essence, unknowable. All we can know is a human experience that comes into being when human nervous systems, which are composed of this unknowable essence, interact with other aspects of this unknowable essence. Mm -hmm. And note that even the most doubting among us believes in this unknowable essence. Mm -hmm. Consider it, the physicists, the atheists, the materialists, they all believe, they don't want, no one doubts that protons, electrons, and atoms and molecules don't exist, they don't doubt that. They believe in protons, electrons, and atoms and molecules, and they admit, they admit the quantum physicists admit. Those are just metaphors. No one has a clue as to what they are. So they believe in this unknowable essence that gives rise to our world of experience. What we sense, what we experience is not something out there. There are no red soft petal flowers or green stems studded with hard, sharp, pointy things out there. Those words refer to the perception, the experience in a mind of a rose. If this is so, without a nervous system to perceive them, there are no roses. They don't exist. Something exists, but no roses. Not what you call a rose, not what I call a rose. No tables, no chairs. There is something, but whatever that something is cannot be known to us. Let's call it, because we're getting to the point here, let's call it, for argument's sake, the thing in itself, or the a priori unperceived substance, or, for short, the unknowable essence. One of the following statements about this unknowable essence must be true. And you can choose whichever one suits you, because they all lead to a necessary belief in God, or what I call Yo, the divine mystery. Something beyond the world of human experience or comprehension. First, what are the three things? You have to believe one of these three, unless you can think of something else. If you can, let me know. One, <laughs> the unknowable essence was created by a creator or a creative force, in which case there is an awesomely mysterious God, and we can go no further. That's more or less traditional forms of religion. Or you can be a materialist, like the scientist, and you can believe it came into being this unknown essence, whatever it is, because we believe in it, we believe it's something we're, all, we're metaphorically describing, we don't really understand, with words like protons and neutrons and quarks and, and strings, we don't know what that is. We believe it exists and it's always existed by, came into being by itself. So either God created it, it came into being by itself, or it's existed throughout all time, there's no need for creation. I don't buy this creation, we don't know if it was ever created. It's just existed, even the Big Bang, we don't know what was before that. Whatever it is, it's always existed. So something is unknowable out there, it gives rise to everything, it's existed, God created it, came into being by itself, or it's existed throughout all time. Now if you reject the first option, God or a creator created it, because there's no evidence for it, and that leaves you with the other two. So the atheist is a force to assume, and this is wordy, but this is where it gets the crux of the matter for me. The atheist is forced to assume that this unknowable essence of the universe either created itself or has existed throughout all time. In either of these two cases, the atheist who insists on believing only in the material world, the materialist who prides himself on not believing in God, is left believing in an infinite, unknowable essence that created itself or has existed through all time without creation and out of which springs all that exists. Let's repeat that. The materialist atheist believes in an infinite, unknowable essence that caused itself to come into being, or an infinite, unknowable essence that has existed throughout all time without creation. In either case, out of this infinite, unknowable essence, all that exists comes into being. Well, I can't really think of a better definition for God. <laughs> an independently existing, uncreated, infinite, unknowable essence that gives rise to all that we experience. This is another way of saying what Meister Eckhart, the mystic, said hundreds and hundreds of years ago. In contemplating the opening words of the book of Genesis, which starts, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. 
Eckhart said, God is the word that speaks itself.